Hello, everyone. Welcome to Idea to IPO. My name is Jennifer. Idea to IPO has been holding tech startup events in Silicon Valley for many, many years. We organize venture capital panels, legal workshops, networking events, and more. These days, we are 100% online. We hold an event nearly every day of the week. Please check out our schedule at idea2ipo.com. Our featured speaker today is Roger Royce, and he is one of the top startup advisory legal attorneys in Silicon Valley who is passionate about helping entrepreneurs succeed. And today we're going to little we're going to learn a little bit more about his latest book release, 10,000 Startups: Legal Strategies for Startup Success. Roger, please take it away. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. And don't go away because I know you've got some questions for me. Uh, I'm Roger Royce. I'm a partner with Haynes Boone. We're an AmLaw 100 law firm. I am based in so part of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, California. And for those of you that have uh, been faithful followers of the Idea to IPO uh, series, I uh, just want to let you know we're going to do things a little bit differently here today. Uh, <clears throat> today, um, I may have a few slides, but mostly we're going to have more of a fireside chat uh, about my new book, 10,000 Startups, Legal Strategies for Startup Success. It actually, um, it's still in pre-release, so if you want the hard copy, I'm going to send everybody a soft copy of this if you signed up for this event, but if you want the hard copy, uh, you can certainly go to Amazon or Book Baby and buy one. Uh, they make great Christmas presents. Uh, trust me on that. Uh, I've got all my Christmas shopping done this year. Let me put it that way. Okay, before we get going, I want to go through our usual housekeeping items. Uh, Jennifer and I are going to have a little discussion about the book for about an hour, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A. If you have questions, go ahead and put those in the Q&A box, uh, not the chat box, the Q&A box, and we'll get to them at the end of the hour. Uh, if there's something that I need to know right now or anybody else does, you can use the chat box. I'll try to keep one eye on that. But I'm not going to look at the Q&A box until after we're finished with our program. And I'm probably not going to look at the chat box after we're done with, with our first hour. So that's how we like to do it. We're very organized here. Um, if you're tweeting today, if you're on Twitter, use hashtag idea to IPO. Uh, again, we are recording this. You'll be getting a copy of the uh, recording and a copy, a uh, digital copy of the book at the end of this program. And you can also access this on my YouTube channel, which has tons and tons of content. So please go to my YouTube channel, there it is. And uh, just hit that subscribe button because the more subscribers I get, the, and uh, the more people get to see all these cool videos that we do almost every other week. All right, with that, let's see if I set up any polls for this. Yes, I did. I guess I'd like to know who is actually out there. So who is in the audience? Because it will inform how this discussion goes. Are you a startup entrepreneur, um, an investor, a service provider, student, professor, government, press media? Who are you? Just give me an idea here. Looks like it's about 80% startup entrepreneurs so far. And we're only uh, 25 seconds into this. Okay, I'm gonna, going to go ahead and close this. We've got 80% startup entrepreneurs, a handful of service providers, a handful of uh, either teachers or students, people from from uh, academia and uh, even some investors. All right, cool. Okay, let's end the poll. So it's mostly startup entrepreneurs, almost 80%. Let's see, you know what else I'd like to know? I'd like to know where you're all from, uh, statistically speaking. We usually draw mostly from North America, but we're doing this at 9 a.m. today so that people in other parts of the world uh, have an opportunity. By the way, make sure you can hear me okay. People in other parts of the world have an opportunity to join in. So, uh, so far it's um, 
We've got 16% Silicon Valley, 18% Silicon Valley, other North America, about 60%. Okay, Asia, 5%, Western Europe, 7%, Eastern Europe and Russia, 2%. And um, South Pacific, we've got some, ah, no Latin in South America today. That's odd. Usually we get a good following down there. Okay, so about 60% other North America, 15% Silicon Valley. And with that, I'm going to end the poll. All righty. Let's see, anything else I wanna tell you? I mentioned this is gonna be on YouTube. I mentioned that you should find me on LinkedIn uh, and, and please connect and you will be getting a copy of our recording at the end of this. Okay, with that, why don't we go ahead and start? And Jennifer, I'm going to turn it back to you because I know you've got some questions for me. Of course I do. I always have a lot of questions for you, Roger. And I am super honored to be the person asking you these questions today. And the first one I have is, why do you do what you do? Uh, <clears throat> And by do what I do, just so everybody knows, uh, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer. I work primarily with technology startups. Uh, I'm in the emerging growth and venture capital group here at my firm. I'm a corporate and tax lawyer. And I'm gonna give you a long-winded answer to that very short question. But for the most part, I, help, I like to help build companies. I like to help build great companies. Uh, my dad was a small businessman and uh, I saw how much he relied on lawyers just to navigate the rules of business. Uh, they were like they were like shamans in the village, right? They had the secret language uh, that would get that would allow people to solve problems and, and get to the next level, and that's what I like to help do for people. So you might say that the reason I do what I do is because I just like to help companies. I like to help build companies, and you know, in startup land, it's a high risk business, and you know. For those of you out there, I know most of you are startup entrepreneurs, and people don't like it when I say this, but you're in a very high risk business. You know, your odds of succeeding the first time out uh, are are low. They just are. Um, but most startup entrepreneurs, I I know, they don't go out just one time. They go out many times. Um, Abraham Lincoln lost his first first six elections before he got into the Senate. I understand, uh, and startup land can be like that. You just wait until you finally get that right combination of, of timing, uh, timing, technology, and people. And then you create something big and you have the possibility of changing the world. And there have been many times over my career when I've sat in a room with somebody and they had an idea uh, that, um, you know, who, who knows? And then five years later, you know, we have a unicorn on our hands. And sometimes I've looked at that idea, and uh, this is why I'm a lawyer and not a client. And I said, "Well, that doesn't sound like a great idea to me, you know. But I'm still gonna I'm gonna bet on you because uh, you know I, I think you got the right stuff. Um, and that's really great when that happens. That is really awesome when that happens. And that, I've had that happen many times over the years. Uh, on the other hand, there's there's a lot of them that got away." Um, and that's a whole nother uh, presentation, I guess, of, of, of great ideas that didn't seem that great to me at the time. Uh, but this book that I wrote uh, most recently, 10,000 Startups are about the great ideas, the ones that worked, all the companies that did everything right. And most of the time you don't hear about them. So my first book, for those of you that tune in a lot, you might remember my first book, Dead on Arrival, How to Avoid the Legal Mistakes That Could Kill Your Startup. That was about all the things you should not do. And I was just basically 30 years of watching people doing dumb things legally and ruining their company. That was a book about people that had a great team and a great technology and everything was right, but they just didn't bother documenting stuff or something like that. Uh, or they didn't get a patent or they didn't do something and it knocked them out of the water. And, and those are, you know, those, those are interesting stories. They're not happy stories. 10,000 startups is more about why I do what I do. It's not, it's not only to avoid the mistakes, but to actually help companies do well and do everything right. And most of those companies you've never heard of and you never will because not many hundred million dollar exits are, are things you're going to read about. You know, in Silicon Valley, that's a small exit, but that's a pretty good payday for a founder. And for that to happen, they have to execute perfectly. 
And that's what this book is about executing perfectly. And I want to help startups execute perfectly. Uh, okay, I hope that answered the question, Jennifer. And you, and you do it very well, Roger. So could you explain a little more about the main message of the book that you want your readers to take away? Yeah, here's here's really the one thing that, that you should really take away from this. And again, I'm going to give you a long-winded answer. Um, I, I don't know. I was thinking about this the other day um, when um, when I was uh, even younger than Jennifer. Um, I just went in for a checkup. To, I went and saw a heart doctor just to make sure, you know. And he checked me over and he says, there's nothing wrong with you. He says, why are you here? And I said, well, I just wanted to make sure, you know, because, you know, I've, I've heard that, you know, you, you can walk around with problems and not know it until it's too late. And he said, look, he said, I've got sick people that want to see me. I've got important stuff to do. He says, don't bother me unless there's something wrong with you. And he sent me out of his office. Unfortunately, that's just the way a lot of people look at lawyers. They don't want to go to a lawyer unless there's something wrong. You know, and by that time, it's often too late. Same and by the way, same in medicine. That's why. Uh, yeah, don't worry. I didn't bother that doctor again. Uh, I'm with a whole different kind of service where we do all sorts of diagnostics way in advance. So I never have problems that I have to go see doctors about. Or that's the idea. I'm not saying it all works. It's preventive. And what I want to do is preventive legal, just the same way that people do preventive health care. Right. And this book is about preventive legal. I want you, the entrepreneur, to know what not to do. Right. And I don't want the first time you see a lawyer uh, to be the time that you've got a demand letter in your hand from another lawyer. You know, I don't want the first time you see a lawyer is when you have a dispute with your co founder because you don't have a good set of agreements uh, when you start at your company. So 10,000 startups is really about. Uh, let's call it preventative legal. And you're all doing the right thing by logging into this webinar and webinars like it and watching the videos and reading the materials because you really do have to educate yourselves. Just like in your own healthcare, you have to take responsibility for your own good legal hygiene. You have to know what questions to ask. Uh, you have to know what's important. Uh, you have to know what to, to press on because it is my experience that most lawyers are not going to volunteer that stuff to you. They're really good at answering the questions you ask, but you have to know what questions to ask. And that is really the main point of the book. Now, that can be awfully dry. I admit it, right? You know, nobody wants to like read a book on dry, you know, legal theories and a bunch of case law and statutes. So what the book does, it really just kind of walks through more anecdotally. And by anecdotally, I don't mean cases that you would read if you went to the library and looked at law books. Uh, I mean, situations when, you know, three guys walk into my office and here's what they say they want to do. And this is how they did it. And this is why it works. You know, this is what they did right. Uh, this is where they got it right. So that is sort of the, the main message and the point of the book. Fantastic. Wow. Could you uh, explain a little bit more about some of the things that will resonate with your readers when they when they have uh, time to go through and read this entire book, which is all um, amazing and interesting, insightful information? What are just a short list of things that you really think that they will hone in yeah. and, and help them with their success? Yeah, and. Um, actually, uh, if we have time, I might even come back and put a few slides up about this. But, but let's go through a couple of things, because even though um, it does say legal strategies for startup success, there's a fine line between legal and business. And uh, I work, you know, in Silicon Valley, I work with venture capital uh, and angel investors. Um, so we have to know what the market is, right? And we have to know how to position a company for that sort of funding. So getting, you know, knowing what kind of entity to form and, you know, how to draft an NDA and stuff, that's only half the battle. You know, the other half the battle is all the other stuff that makes a startup successful. So let's walk through a couple of them. And I talk a lot about this in the book. You may have to read a ways to get there, uh, but I do talk a lot about this. Number one, getting funded. Okay, getting funded, because that is the number one question I get 
from every company I see. Yeah, we need a corporation and we need shareholder agreements and we need all that other stuff. But if we don't get funded, none of this matters at all. None of this means anything. So that's the number one thing. Well, so I go through this. I go through this where you're likely to meet funders, what kind of what you should ask for, what you'd expect to give up, uh, what kind of rights and obligations that means, uh, how to be intelligent about it, how to present yourself to these investors like you know what you're doing, uh, how not to waste your time on things that are not going to work, and how to really focus on talking to people that are going to fund a company. Uh, so getting funded. And then uh, uh, quite a bit on the legal side of that. Now, once you have somebody that is interested, that's only half the battle, right? You climb Mount Everest, you know, you get to the top, you got to get back. So you're only halfway there. Once you have somebody who's interested, we have to be able to fashion an investment that's going to satisfy their needs, right? And their needs might be... Um, well, of course, they want equity usually, or they want something that'll convert to equity. But they, but what I mean by their needs are by what kind of return are they looking for? And angels are looking for a different kind of risk return profile than VCs typically. I know that's a little counter to what you might have heard, but that has been my experience. And it kind of depends on the angel, right? And so first of all, we and we can fashion an instrument that meets meets that risk return profile. That's what I mean about executing perfectly. You know, give the investor what they want. On the other hand, we need to know what you're willing to give up and at least that you understand what it is that you're giving up. Um, you know, I, I've been recently, here's a side, I'm gonna take a side note. We haven't talked about this too much yet on ID to IPO, but there is a new kind of financing out there, um, especially, especially given the fact but I'm seeing more and more companies that are doing a better job of getting to revenue than they used to. They're doing a better job of, of, of getting to margin or EBITDA. That means they're making money uh, more quickly than they used to. I'm seeing companies do a better job. And they're not, you know, so, so they've got revenue and they've got income. And I talk about this in my book. Yeah, you know, you, you may be a you know, candidate for venture or angel money, you probably don't have enough revenue or income for debt, and you probably have enough income where we can de-risk. So what's left? Well, I've been thinking a lot about royalty financing lately, and we talk about that in the book. So there are lots of alternatives. Um, and royalty financing is basically, you sell, it's like Bruce Springsteen selling his album collection. You sell just a piece of revenue uh, from a product line or from your company for a period of time. So the investor likes it, and some angels really want that. They want a more certain, more immediate return today, and they're willing to give up that huge upside 10 years from now to get something you know, two or three years from now that's a little smaller. And you, the company, equity is the most expensive money you can buy. If you're giving up equity for cash, that is the most expensive money you can buy because you are going to be giving up a lot for that equity piece down the road. So royalty financing kind of bridges that gap. Um, you're not giving up quite so much and you're actually, you're getting the funding, the investor's getting what they want to. So I just use that as an example of just making sure that we get this right with your investor. Uh, on that point, another side note, there are lots of sources of funding that people don't even think about. There's government grants, which is a lot of work, I'll admit it, it's not for everybody. There's crowdfunding, which is, uh, again, there's an art to that as well, right? There's an art to crowdfunding and the rules have recently changed. You know what crowdfunding is? That's where you can go out onto a platform and there are a handful of very reputable sites and you can sell very small amounts of equity to lots of people, like maybe $2,000 at a shot uh, to, to lots and lots of people. And that used to be problematic and clunky but it's gotten way better now because you can raise up to $5 million in a year by doing this. And we now have this thing where you can test the waters. So you don't have to go out and launch your site and then just cross your fingers and just hope like heck that it doesn't fail. And the whole world knows now that you failed the crowdfunding. You can go test the waters before you do your crowdfinancing. And that's really huge. 
And then also we can also consolidate uh, the crowd finance investors. So we have a way to deal with them on your cap table. So anyway, there are, there are, there is art to this and there's a lot of things that are happening in the market and a lot of ways to raise money just beyond venture, private equity and angel. But we do talk about all of that in the book. Um, okay. So that's one thing that I think will resonate with people, how to raise money. The second thing, Everybody, the, the venture capital is the holy grail. You know, everybody wants to go talk to a VC. And, and that's fine. You know, I, I've got nothing against VCs. I work with them all day, every day. Uh, but just keep in mind that, you know, venture financing, maybe I should put up a slide here. Let's try this. Venture financing is really, it's at an all time high. Um, Jennifer, can you tell me if you can see my screen one? Yes, I see a screen and VC funding at a record high. Is there just one slide or do you see two? I see the next slide too. Okay, that means I screwed it up. So I'm gonna do that again. But I really want you to see this. I'm gonna to go to screen two. Three. Now you should see one slide, right? Yes, perfect. Awesome. Yeah, so last year was a record year for our startup investment and exits. And this year is gonna be twice as big as last year in venture. Think about that, right? Last year was a record year. This year is gonna be twice as, it's probably gonna be, or 2021 was twice as big as 2020, right? And 2020 was a big year. So there's a tremendous amount of money out there in the market. And what's driving that? A tremendous amount of exits, big exits, right? Big exits, you know, twice as many as 2020. A uh, trillion dollars. And when you have exits, that means there's more startup acquisitions, there's more startups, there's more opportunity. But really, the big news here is just how much money venture capital has uh, to invest in this, right? And how much is available to invest now. And as of the time I put this slide together, you know, there was $900 billion of, you know, of dry powder. You know what I mean by dry powder? That means money that VCs are sit, sitting on that they have to invest. And uh, about 17% of you are from the Bay Area where I am. So let me just give you some numbers here. Uh, 2021, you know, was a big year for Bay Area startups. $88 billion, $100 billion, more than $100 billion here in the Bay Area, just in the Bay Area of venture capital money and the startups. So it's a tremendously huge area here. And there's just a lot of opportunity. I'll come back to these slides later, but I just wanted to illustrate that. So I think that's going to resonate with people. Um, the other thing I think will resonate, because I'm just kind of going through the questions that I get, is I tend to work mostly with tech startups, not exclusively, but mostly. And people talk about, well, gee, how do I create that magic, you know, that alchemy, you know, that turning something into gold uh, that we call technology here in the Bay Area. Well, I'm not a technologist, but I can help you protect it, right? So if you come up with a patent uh, or a trade secret or a process or a design or a code uh, that can do that alchemy, uh, we can certainly help you make sure that it belongs to you. And by belongs to you, what I mean is that you can stop other people from doing what you're doing. And that's huge for a startup company, right? That is huge. And the U.S. government, you know, will provide you with that legal monopoly if you do things correctly, to make sure that you have an opportunity to go out and market your technology and, and get it into the market. And, and you can understand why, right? If you, didn't, you, know, if you weren't assured that you're gonna have that little monopoly, at least for a, a limited amount of time, you might not be able to justify going through the trouble uh, of, of, of building the technology. So IP creation is a big part. Um, the other thing I want to go through just a few, just a couple more. And then the fourth thing I would say is attracting and retaining talent, uh, because that's always a big issue with companies, because this is really a people business. Your company is so much a people business. You know, I was telling you earlier about, you know, companies I've seen do great and companies I've seen do not so great. And I wish I had a nickel every time I had people sit down and, and describe to me an idea that I thought was just totally ridiculous, would not work, but the people describing it made it work, 
right? They were just so awesome, they made it work, right? And I've seen the flip side too. I, I will tell you that I saw the exact business model for Facebook long before there was a Facebook, just that the team could not implement. They just didn't have the right stuff. People are so important. So you really have to you know, make sure that you attract the right people and retain them. And, and, and the flip side of that is that when those people leave, you need to get their equity back. So I, I, have, I talk a lot to people about how do we make sure that we're incentivizing, we're attracting the right people and we're incentivizing them and we're, we're keeping them in the company. Um, and then finally, uh, limiting, by the way, on that, the one story I do like to tell a lot, um, and this is all public knowledge, so I'm not speaking out of school, you can read this, um, but um, Pandora is a great company. Uh, that's a good example of a really good CEO, a really good founder, right? Because Pandora, when it launched, it launched um, in a recession uh, without any money. <laughs> um, and its business was basically illegal, right? Okay, those are some pretty bad facts for a company to launch. But look how successful that company is. They just kept pivoting and kept pivoting. And by illegal, I don't mean they were doing anything criminal. I just mean that they had copyright issues with their model, right? <clears throat> but they managed to, to change the company. They managed to basically will it to happen. It became a very successful company. You see a lot of companies like that, um, right? It's just teams, the right team. So you got to get the right team on board and make sure they stay with the company. Uh, you know, they stay with the company long enough. Okay. Um, and by the way, I don't tell the Pandora story in my book. I do tell, tell the Zipcar story book in my, the Zipcar story in my book. That's another very successful company. And I go through how they got to where they started and where they ended up. And you'll want to know about that because that's the story of, of every person, right? That's the every person story because almost every startup just, it just reminded me of every startup I've ever seen, some, some of the trials and tribulations they had. And then finally, um, limiting liability. People, that's kind of number one on people's minds. They heard my first rule that what you're doing is very risky, Abraham Lincoln, remember? So they say, well, I want to make sure that I live the fight again. And this is another thing that people don't think enough about. And I don't mind that, um, that hubris and that extreme optimism, I think you have to have that to be uh, successful in startups. Um, God, I just watched the, uh, the show about Theranos the other day and talk about extreme optimism, you know, uh, in the face of, you know, maybe contrary realities, but pretty much every startup I see has an extreme optimism on what they're doing. Uh, in fact, some people would call it a suspension of disbelief, you know, uh, but whatever it is, uh, nobody thinks enough about, it seems, and they don't ask questions about, and therefore they don't get advice about, well, what if this one doesn't do well? What if this company doesn't do well? Uh, you know, I want to be able to live the fight another, another day because my next idea might do well. And I have a whole chapter about, you know, you got to protect yourself, you know, it, I, I swing for the fences, aim for the sun, you know, expect to win, be super confident, but you got to protect yourself and you got to limit your liability. And I tell stories about companies that were able to, I'm going to give you one right now, uh, since you asked, because limiting liability, you might say, well, why are you even talking about that? No one else ever talks about that. That's easy. You form a corporation and you're done. Yeah, no, it's, it's not quite that easy. So many years ago, I had a client, an inventor client, um, who came up with a really good technology. I, I don't want to, I would give it away if I, if I told you too much about it. Let's just say it had a lot of applications, right? This particular technology, which she had patents on, um, it was useful in this field of use, in this industry. It's also useful in that industry and another one. But we didn't really know 100% which one would be successful. Of course, we thought they would all be successful, right? But so when we started the first company, we did a very limited license to that first company in that one particular vertical. And that first company did a Series A funding 
They did a Series B funding. Series B, they took a lot of money from venture capitalists, marquee venture capitalists. Then, of course, they kicked my guy out. They got a new CEO, and they were unable to execute, and the company failed. The company failed. And when it failed, uh, the CEO looked around and said, oh, my God, we're in the wrong vertical. We should be using this technology in that vertical, not this vertical. And then uh, eventually I got a call from the company's lawyer and said, you know, uh, it turns out we don't own the rights to that vertical, which is the profitable one. I said, that's right, you don't, because uh, my client owns those rights and he is commercializing that someplace else. And between you and I, he made me millions of dollars commercializing it in vertical number two. And the VCs, they lost their money in vertical number one. So he was very successful with that. Uh, he planned ahead. Now, how often is it that you see the VCs lose money and the founders make money? So I'm just saying, you ask the right questions, uh, you prepare yourself, and you can get really good results. And by the way, don't shed any tears for the VCs, right? All of those funds, you know, they all return, you know, 10 times their money to their investors. They did very well with all their other investments. Um, and that, by the way, is a whole other chapter, believe it or not, uh, or not a chapter, but at least a section of the book, um, because this is, I mean, this is business. I mean, it's a tough business. It's a, you know, it's competitive. It is a game. And oftentimes I hear people talk about, oh, it's so unfair. You know, this is unfair and that's unfair. And I talk a little bit about the ethics of what we're doing and the ethics of dividing up that pie and making deals and uh, why you should not apologize at all for being successful, especially when you're dealing with the kind of people you're going to have to deal with to get there. They're all very sophisticated. And because you are well-armed, you shouldn't feel bad about that at all. Okay, Jennifer. That's so a fantastic thought. Thank you so much, Roger. And when you have a second there, could you switch to gallery view? Oh, I'm sorry. And then we'll get to our next question. No, we're on gallery view. Go ahead. Okay, great. So how could startups get themselves ready for venture capitalists and how might they find angels? How can startups get ready for venture capitalists and how might they find angels? Um, well, let me let me take uh, let me take both. Well, first of all, uh, any investor is going to expect your company to look a certain way, right? And uh, Dead on Arrival talks a lot about getting that wrong, but that's an easy one, right? That's an easy one. If, uh, it, you know, there are plenty of good lawyers around here that can give you the right structure so that you look a certain way, if that's what you're talking about. So, so number one, you know, you have to have the right sort of structure. That's the right kind of company, right kind of corporation, the right kind of vesting restrictions in place, uh, the uh, right um, uh, IP protection, all the stuff you go through a due diligence list. And these days, uh, it also means ESG, environmental social governance. And we talk about that in some of our other presentations. So keep, keep that in mind. So that's the legal side. Um, but then there's also a little bit more of a non-legal side as to how you get there. And the, the best way is to, is to get a really a good warm introduction. And the number one uh, most valuable thing you can get as an entrepreneur is an introduction to an, an investor from a company that that investor has invested in, right? Because you are pre-vetted, you're pre-qualified, somebody they trust has already spoken for you. Uh, and then there are varying degrees beyond that. But that's number one. Um, uh, yeah, I guarantee you, you you'll get their attention if you do that. Uh, with regard to the angels, that's way tougher because they're not advertising. Um, the VCs are advertising. You can go on their website. You know, they got forms you fill out on their website. You can tell they're, they're out actively looking for you. And they're probably going to find you before you find them sometimes. But, um, but you're going to need angel money before you get there. And, and again, that's a lot harder because they're, you know, they're harder to find. But they're not impossible to find. There are events. There are groups, there are programs. Some of them fund a really high amount of the companies they see because they vet them so carefully. And it's really important just to, to, to get into that ecosystem. I don't know how else to say it. You just have to be part of that community. 
And I can't tell you how many times, um, one story in the book uh, is about uh, a pretty famous VC that from time to time I do some work for, who um, met with a company that uh, it, it's now, I mean, they sold for close to a billion dollars. So, but the founder at the time, he just had this idea. And the VC got the pitch deck, did the meeting, you know, went through the slides. And it's like, that's, I don't get it. You know, that's too far out for me. And they passed, right? Well, then this VC runs into that exact same founder. I think it's at a party or a networking event or something like that, a social event. And um, he just happened to talk a little bit more about his company. And as this VC person uh, listened to the story, it was like, wow, this guy really believes this. And now I'm kind of starting to see the vision. So, you know, that didn't happen through formal. And then they invested and they made a lot of money. Everybody made a lot of money. So um, what I'm saying is that that didn't happen through a formal process. That happened through just being in the network right? And being in the ecosystem. And right now, I mean, over the last two years, we've seen this like mass migration out of California for lots of very good reasons uh, to, to, to better places like North Carolina and Miami and Austin. Uh, and they have their own ecosystems for sure. And that's fine. Just be in that ecosystem. But, you know, there's something to be said for being here in Silicon Valley as well in this humongous ecosystem, <laughs> if you're talking to, to, to VCs or wanting to meet with those folks. Oh yeah, that's fantastic information, thank you. And you know, one thing that I've been wondering and couldn't wait for the perfect opportunity to ask you is how do you select from all of the entrepreneurs who want to work with you? How do I select? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, um, I kind of have to believe it. Well, I'm like a VC just as a lawyer as well. So, so not kind of have to believe it. I have to believe it. You know, I have to believe it. And, you know, I don't, you don't have to be a hundred percent chance of success. I know this is a high risk business, but I have to believe that what you're doing uh, is, is going to be successful. Um, first of all, and because I'm a lawyer, that's where I start, right? you know, do you have the rights to do this, right? Is the business, you know, is, is the structure, and it doesn't even have to be an established market now. I mean, look at Airbnb, and there was no market for what they did when they started out. They, they created the market. You know, social media just created the market. But I have to believe it's a market that, that you're going to be able to create. Um, um, I, I, you know, pedigree is nice, but not necessary. Uh, and more than that, you know, more than, you know, all those credentials on your resume, uh, I really look more for expertise. Mm -hmm. And I've seen, you know, people get into a business, the really successful ones is when they find a need. And they know because they're in that business that there is that need, and then they go market it to everybody else. So for example, I do a lot of work with agriculture technology companies. And the most successful companies I found are people, and they didn't have to be farmers, but they found a need and they talked to a farmer or they got a farmer under advisory board or something, but somehow they got someone to tell them, this is a problem that we have to solve. And uh, like Ben Horowitz says, you know, you want to sell uh, aspirin, not vitamins. It's a real problem that we're, that we're solving, right? We're giving you a solution to something that you absolutely really want to have. Not a nice to have, but a must have. And to, to really know that, I, I think it's important that you have somebody that really has domain expertise. So, so domain expertise is really, really important to me. Um, and then there's, you know, there's that intangible quality because some people, you just know that they're just going to succeed. They're gonna do whatever it takes. You know, they're gonna do what has to be done. Um, they're, they just got, you know, that, uh, how do they, they just they just have whatever it is. It, 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 so when I was a kid, I grew up in North Dakota. Big sport in North Dakota was fishing and hunting. And I had a friend um, who he always got birds when he went out hunting. He always got them. And when he went fishing, he always caught fish, you know, even when they weren't biting. He wasn't any smarter than the rest of us. He, you know, 
he wasn't any better. He wasn't using better equipment. You know, he just had that kind of personality. He was just going to succeed. And that's kind of the number one thing I think I look for in it. And some people call it grit, right? Some people call it grit. So that's probably the number one thing for me. Because if I don't work for successful companies, I'm not going to be in business long. So I really want to pick successful companies. And I do look very hard at the people. Um, and then all the normal legal due diligence. Let's walk through a couple of things. Um, I want to know that, uh, again, number one, because I work mostly with tech companies, I want to know that, that you're going to be developed some IP that's protectable. That's going to give you your, your unfair competitive advantage, your monopoly in the market, your secret sauce, whatever you want to call it. Uh, let's make sure that that you're first, first of all, that you're smart enough to, to create it, uh, that you're honest enough not to steal it from someplace. Believe it or not, I have to look pretty hard at that oftentimes, uh, and that you're wise enough to protect it. Okay, so IP is rights are going to be important to me for a tech company. Uh, if you're not a tech company, and then it's less important, of course. Um, and then I also want to know that the founder, the founding group, and it's usually co-founders, hardly ever do I see one founder anymore, it's usually co-founders, that they're the kind of group that's going to be cohesive. And I just hate it when founders fight because, you know, that makes it 10 times harder to succeed. I want to see founders that not only can get along during good times, but can have difficult conversations. Somebody isn't pulling their weight know that, that they can have those conversations about readjusting equity. Um, so those are probably the, the two big things, the people and, um, and the IP. Wonderful. Wow. Thank you so much for that. And to uh, touch on that a little bit more, but uh, I would like to learn more with, you know, which aspects of your profession that you love the most. Well, um, so probably uh, where we started in this conversation, um, the, the best part about it is um, watching people create something from nothing and create these businesses and, um, and being successful. I really like to see companies succeed. And I work really hard to make sure that they do and to do everything I can to, to, to help them succeed. Uh, so that's that's probably the very best part about it. And the reason that that's so important to me, because, look, we could all be doing something else, right? We could all have a day job. We could all be punching a clock, you know, an eight to five. And, and most of us probably do and then do our startup, our side hustles at nights and weekends. Um, but this is really freedom, right? And it's not just financial freedom. Uh, startup is freedom to go... To, to express yourselves. It's freedom of self-expression, it really is, because you're kind of building your vision and you're imposing your vision on the world. And this is a way that people can do that. And I think that's what people ought to be allowed to do in this world, right? Um, so I'm not the Dalai Lama, but I did hear him say one time that everybody has a right to be happy. Uh, uh, in startup land, I think that means that everybody should have a right you know, to, to take a shot and uh, create a startup and create that new business model. Fantastic. Wow. I love that. Uh, which areas of technology are you most interested in nowadays? Oh, wow. Well, like I said, I do a lot with agriculture technology. Uh, I think uh, the technology of food production is really um is really important. And, you know, I'm not going to beat a horse over this, but, you know, food insecurity is a major problem uh, around the world and other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And it's about to become an even bigger problem because of what's going on geopolitically. And the obvious solution to that is agriculture technology. So I'm very interested in that. I come from an agricultural area. You know, I understand a little bit about it. Um, so I've made that a focus in my practice over the last 10 years. So I'm interested in that. Energy is the same way. I think energy technology and both ag tech and energy tech tie into the environment uh, because we've heard a lot over the last several years about environmental concerns, climate change, et cetera. 
technology can solve both those problems. There's no doubt in my mind uh, if it focuses on the ag sector and the energy sector, as it is doing. So I'm doing a lot of energy tech deals uh, these days, and I always have. Um, 20 years ago, in fact, I co-founded a geothermal company, you know, which is about as clean tech as you can get. Um, it, uh, and that company's still around. I'm not involved in it, of course, anymore. So um, I'm really interested in that aspect of it. And of course, uh, FinTech, uh, uh, FinTech, especially as it relates to blockchain and distributed ledger uh, and all the new ways that we can commercialize assets. Uh, I'm not sure where the where F NFTs are going to go. There's a lot of like legal issues with NFTs that we have to work our way through. It's just unclear, it's uncertain. The law hasn't kept up. It's kind of a lawyer's playground in a way. And that's why I, I probably do more work in that than, than, uh, uh, than I used to. But let me just pause on this for a second. Uh, blockchain has applied to NFTs. I, I view that like the internet basically digitized information and blockchain is digitizing products, right? And NFTs come along and they're basically creating products. Uh, and that's, a, that's great. I mean, that's a great sector. As long as we're adding value, we've got to work through the legal issues and the law has not caught up. Uh, the second part of that that I'm really interested in is the DAO, uh, the Distributed Autonomous Organizations because I think that there's a way that we can provide traditional legal protections to the DAO. And I think a DAO is a great thing. You know, again, the law has not caught up to it yet, but we do have some legal structures, especially if you're in Wyoming or Delaware, by the way, uh, that will provide traditional legal protections that people wanna to pool together uh, in an online environment uh, using distributed ledger technology to do things. And, and for those of you who don't do this, the DAO is basically the kind of the, one of the defining features is that it's democratized, right? Like everybody uh, can make decisions in, in a DAO and code is law and uh, you, you make your decisions through, you know, through this technology. Uh, the problem with that is that, well, gee, that means everybody has liability. What was my first rule? You know, live to fight another day. So uh, I'm interested in, in getting involved in this and helping DAOs protect people from some of the legal risk. And then um, finally, uh, say probably the biggest sector for last is health tech. I mean, it's just been a revolution in healthcare technology over the last uh, few years, especially since COVID. And uh, that's something that it's, you know, that we're seeing everything change. We're seeing everything change so quickly and it really has to change. I'm really not happy. I'm still mad about that doctor 40 years ago who kicked me out of his office and told me to never come back unless I was sick. I mean, what a terrible way to treat people. I think healthcare has to change. I think we have to have telemedicine. You know, I think we have to have patients taking responsibility for their health and being armed with the tools to do that. I think we need preventative healthcare, you know, to reduce our healthcare costs. It's crazy what health insurance costs in this company. And it's crazy how many people are not covered. And I think a big part of that is just because of the way America delivers healthcare. Um, so those are the big things. And the final thing I'll say about that <laughs> is that our Securities and Exchange Commission just has to catch up, man. They just got to hire smarter people. I'm sorry to say, if, if, that, if that's the problem, they need to understand you know, blockchain and they just got to catch up with what's going on. I mean, they're just hindering us just so badly. And we could be doing so much more if we had a government and a regulatory authority that would just, you know, get on a stick here. Anyway, end of rant. <laughs> that was fantastic. As per the usual, Roger. Okay, let's see. What do we want to know next about you? How about uh, your proudest achievement in your life? Um. <laughs> that assumes I've had achievements in my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, you brought this book to the surface, which I'm sure it, it, you would have to live Roger Royce's life in order to in, in order to do this. And you're one of the few people on this planet that could bring this knowledge forward. And we're very grateful for that. Yeah, thank so you, thank the you. new chairman of my fan club. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, let's limit that to professional achievements. Uh, yeah, I'm really happy with the book. Um, I, you know, it, it, it was years and years in the making. I can't tell you how many times I rewrote it. 
uh, I just sit down and edit it. And I said, you know, it, it just sucks too much still. And I just started over and just re rewrote it over and over again. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy with the way it turned out. I, I think it, you know, it, it got the points across. I want it to get across. Um, you really have to read to the end though, because it starts off, um, you know, I just kind of follow just basic legal principles. And towards the end is where I kind of get out over my skis a little further and say, and here's my opinion about some non-legal stuff that I've seen over the last zillion years of doing this like how you really attract the VC or how you win in a negotiation. We didn't even talk about that. I got a whole chapter about negotiation because most people are terrible at it. You know, most lawyers are terrible at it. So, uh, and, and I'm not saying I'm great at it. I am saying that I have observed a few things over the years and I put them in the book. So yeah, I'm really happy with the book, I'd say. Well, thank you again. And it is, this has been a, extremely insightful presentation. And I look forward to reading the book again and again. Uh, there's a lot there. It's like a, a movie that is full of information and entertainment. And I just want to replay it. I'll take it to the beach with me and and just make uh, sure. Uh, I beach, uh, awesome. Yes, it, it's, it's definitely the top of my list. Uh, do we have time for some more questions? Maybe one or two. Okay, let's. Uh, why, why don't we? Why don't we open it up for questions? Um, so, uh, so, okay. So, I just got a, a question in the chat. Use the Q and A if you got questions. But the chat is a good is a good com The comment says that Amazon says it's not released, uh, and it's uh, you can pre order it on Amazon, and uh, you can get the hard copy in April. It'll be about middle of April that they'll be shipping out hard copies, but you can get it on Kindle tomorrow if you want it, or you can get it from me uh, today. All right. Um, let me go through a couple of these questions. Okay, here's somebody who wants to go into business with his cousin. Um, cousin is the technical guy. Uh, we, we've got a technical partner and we've got a um, a marketing person, we'll say a business marketing person. So the question is, how do I prevent my partner from stealing my idea and going and doing this with someone else? And by the way, I totally get what you're saying. I told, is it on, by the way, it's not on Audible yet, but it will be, don't worry. Back to your question. I totally get it. I've seen this so many times. It's usually the CFO that's nervous because CFOs, you know, you can replace a CFO their, tech, their expertise translates really well across companies, um, but it's harder to replace a technical person. So I hear the business or the financial person saying, well, they can find another one of me, but they might not be able to find another, you know, technology person who understands this tech. So I'm worried, you know, how do I, you know, how do I secure my position in this company? Well, I got a really easy answer for you. You form a company. You put in place the standard agreements. Within those agreements, there are two really important things. One is an invention assignment, which basically says, you, Mr. Inventor guy, I'm going to give you my time and sweat and labor and leverage my connections, connections and open my Rolodex, et cetera. In exchange for that, you're going to contribute your technology to this new company. And we're going to own this company in whatever our negotiated percentages are. By the way, a whole, a whole chapter in the book is to tell you what those percentages should be, just so you know. But we're gonna own this company in accordance with those percentages. And um, then we're gonna share the profits. Now, that's, now, now, once you have that set of agreements, you have basically locked everybody into this company. Now that's good and it's bad. It's good because you can work really hard on this knowing that someone's not gonna leave and take the tech with them to a new company. They can't, it belongs to first company, we'll call it. Also, that person has fiduciary obligations, the first company. So you have really a lot of confidence that you, know, you can invest your time and labor and sweat into this company and, it, and you're gonna be rewarded for it if the company's successful and you're not gonna get cut out of the deal. The bad part about that is it's really hard to cut somebody out of that deal. So if somebody turns out not to be who you thought they were, you're kind of married to that person, right? You know, for better or worse, right? You guys are stuck together. 
um, until you negotiate some sort of settlement. Now, there are protections we usually put in place to deal with that. The most common one is called vesting. So in other words, vesting means a person earns into their shares over time. And we usually have what we call a one-year cliff, which means that a person has no right to their shares until they've been with the company for a year. And now that doesn't mean someone can leave and take the tech, they still can't. It just means that you have to prove yourself if you wanna stay with the company and everybody else has to prove themselves as well. Because otherwise the other co-founders will get 10 months out and they'll say, you know, Joe there, he isn't able to do what he said he was going to do. So uh, we're going to terminate him and uh, use his shares to find another person to do that. So that's kind of a long answer, but that's generally the idea. All right, we have a kind of a, a technical question about trademarks here. Uh, there's a word that's in circulation um, and it's already been used uh, to designate People are using it already in commerce. Can I trademark it? The answer is no, <laughs> because you know, tra trademark, um, uh, trademark, uh, it's a first use concept with, with trademark. And here, here, let me just talk a little bit about trademarks uh, because this is one thing companies oftentimes get wrong. Um, so first of all, uh, your, your trademark, it, it has to be um, a word that doesn't have the secondary meaning. Right, so good trademarks, if you think about it, the best trademarks are words that are not descriptive. Um, there are words that are kind of made up, like Google's kind of a made up word, and, and Exxon and Xerox, and you know, powerful trademarks are just made up words, right? Bad trademarks are words that people are already using. And sometimes a mark becomes so popular that it becomes, you know, just, just a word and it loses its trademark protection. Here, go Xerox this. I guess we don't do that anymore. Um, so you want, you know, so, uh, and you don't want foreign words either. I mean, you don't want words that have, that are merely descriptive. And it sounds like if this word is already being used in your industry to describe something, it sounds like it's already taken on a descriptive meaning. Now, here, here's the problem. So when you form a company, think about this. Let's say that, well, let's say you're Snapchat, okay? And your whole value lies in the fact, okay, you got some technology and yes, you can have pictures disappear and, and Hillary Clinton likes that. So you got some PR out of that. But really the big value is how many users are actually going to you know, come on to Snapchat because how tough is that to replicate? I don't know, probably not that tough, right? So your real value is getting those users to come back again and again to your site. Well, you, that's very much tied into your name and your mark. So if you lose the rights to that name and mark, oh man, you're toast, right? So it's really important to get the mark right. And what you ought to do is first you have to do a Google search. And if you come up with somebody using the same or a similar name in your business, get a different mark. You know, don't come and argue with me about, oh, can't we, you know, distinguish ourselves this way or that way? Just get a different mark, save yourself the extreme risk of losing all the goodwill in your business because someone sent you a cease and desist letter and took all your value away. Then second, go to the patent and trademark office and do a knockout search. And then thirdly, file a registration so you know you have the mark. I talk in my book, which we are talking about here today, about a company that um, is an online company. Um, they're a decacorn now, they're huge. Right, but I met this company when it was just a guy and an idea. And he was an app builder and he built dozens of apps. All of them failed, all of them failed except one. And that one uh, got some traction and we put it into a corporation. We got some angel money, we got some venture money. Um, and now he's a, it's a very big company, all right? And, uh, but, it is so wrapped up in his name and mark because the technology is, is cool, but eh, you know it, it could be replicated. Well, early on in this company's life, um, we got a nasty letter from a lawyer and said, hey, you guys are using my trademark. And this is right before we did our VC funding. So at the time, I don't know, the company is worth somewhere between 10 and $50 million, I suppose. You're using my mark and we can prove it. We were using it before you were. And here's the proof. 
And, uh, you know, so either pay us or stop using it or something. And we went in and negotiated a settlement. There was a litigation started. And we negotiated a settlement and we were able to settle that case and get exclusive rights to the mark. It was a very delicate negotiation, very delicate because what the person who, who was making the claim did not realize was just how valuable that mark was to us. They had no idea what they were sitting on. Uh, so we were able to settle it for a few hundred thousand dollars when it was worth you know, 10 or 20 times that at least. Um, so that's a success story. That was a, a case of, now the original mistake of picking the mark, that happened long before I got involved. I never, never would have let them use that mark if I'd known, uh, but that mark had been established before we even got involved and we were able to fix it. Usually the story doesn't end quite that happily. It's usually a much bigger settlement that has to be made. So anyway, the moral of the story is trademarks are super important. Pay attention to them and do it right. All right. Um, And I send a pitch deck to you. Sure, send it to me. I get these all the time. I, I prefer an executive summary. And, and by the way, let me tell you why. A pitch deck, deck takes a long time to read through. And, and, you know, and, I, and I do that. I read through them. But um, um, let me tell you, an executive summary is just one or two pages, right? And it just gives me the facts. Um, the, um, the name of the company, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the business of the company, the industry, the market, uh, the technology, the team, just the facts, but in particular, you know, your market and your industry. And if I have an executive summary, then I have at a glance, because I usually think about who might want to invest in this stuff. I know a lot more about you at a glance. By the way, I got a comment here that distracted me uh, in the chat, uh, who uh, thinks that, who says that descriptive and generic names are good for SEO. So again, this is not a trademark issue. You know, use whatever word you want to use for your SEO uh, all over your text. But the mark that identifies your company, you do not want a descriptive word. I'm telling you, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna regret it down the road uh, when you find out that you just can't trademark it. You can't get protection. So, uh, but but yeah, I'm totally with you on on having good words for SEO. I'm just talking about. The mark that I, you know what a trademark is, right? So right above me, see that Haynes Boone, that is a trademark, right? That's another trademark, right? That's what I'm talking about when I say trademark. Uh, what are your thoughts on equity crowdfunding? Um, yeah, let's talk a little bit. I got a couple questions, several questions about crowd financing. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, um, in 2012, uh, President Obama signed into law the Jobs Act uh, to jumpstart our business something or other creation, job creation act. Um, and it was designed to do a whole lot of things, uh, create jobs in particular. And I'm sure, you know, you know, it probably did. But one of the things it did is it loosened up uh, the rules for startup companies to go raise money. And what the act did is it said, look, if you can raise up to a million dollars in a 12 month period from anybody, they don't have to be accredited. They don't have to be institutions, widows and orphans, you know, just as long as it's, um, it meets uh, some fairly minimal uh, requirements in terms of net income and net worth. And it's small amounts, like up to a couple grand each, each, each investor. You do it on an internet portal, you have a business plan, you might have to have audited statements. Um, you have to make a filing with the Securities and Exchange Commission, et cetera. I didn't like it. I'll tell you, I talked a lot about it, sat on a lot of panels. I didn't like it. I said, that's just not enough money. A million dollars um, for all of that work. I mean, you gotta, you gotta have audited statements. You gotta have a business plan. You gotta make these filings. And all of that, just so you don't, you know, just because you don't want to go to accredited investors. So does everyone know what accredited investor is? That's somebody who has, uh, who earns $200,000 a year, 300,000 jointly for the current year and the previous two years, or has a net worth of at least a million dollars, excluding their personal residence. Normally in financings, 
you, you have to have accredited investors, or you want to, we should say. There are exceptions where you don't need it. But here in where I practice, basically we say, look, for lots of complex reasons I won't bore you with, we're going to limit our offering to accredited investors so it doesn't cause problems down the road. Okay, so Jobs Act said, look, you can go out to like lots and lots of people. Not only that, you can put it on a portal where a lot of people can, can come can look at it. Now, the Jobs Act did that. It said you can raise small amounts through an internet portal. It also said you can raise uh, unlimited amounts from accredited investors and you can advertise. So it really opened up lots of new sources for startups. And I really like the second part. Accredited investors, you can advertise. I like that. We'll do that. Now you have to verify that the investors are credited if you do that, but there are services that will do that for you. And it's relatively dirt cheap. So good system. And then you've got AML, KYC, that's anti-money laundering, know your customer, all that stuff. But we have services that can do that. So we have a really great avenue for raising money. So accredit it, you can advertise on these platforms like AngelList is a good example. Or uh, crowdfunding. Uh, Start Engine, Republic, um, who's the other one? Crowdsource or somebody. So those are, not, now I didn't like it because it wasn't enough money and it had restrictions and you had a million $2,000 shareholders on your cap table. And that just like as a lawyer, that just looked like a nightmare to me. That's a million potential plaintiffs, right? But the law has changed and I'm much more in favor of this law now because now the law is you can raise up to 5 million in a 12 month period. You can test the waters. We've had some questions about what test the waters means is you can go on Facebook and say, hey everybody, uh, if I were to sell stock in my company in a crowdfunding, do you think you might be interested? So you can like, you know, do some, some pre-offer notifications. Um, and also uh, you can have custodial arrangements so you can consolidate the vote for all of those $2,000 investors into one entity. So it's not driving you crazy trying to get votes. And most recently, there's also protections put in place so that we have a way of dealing with these people uh, down the road when we do our accredited only investment and uh, that offering doesn't mess up our later offering. And that's probably more detail than we need to get into today. Um, but there are securities law exemptions. So the law is finally, it took 10 years but the law finally came around to where it works. And I'm, I'm a fan of crowd financing, uh, provided that we do it knowingly and intelligently and carefully, and also comply with state blue sky laws because too many people just ignore that. And that's, um, uh, it's not a problem till it's a problem. It hasn't been a big problem for a lot of people yet, but you just, you just watch. See, the SEC needs to do that in blockchain, the way they did it in crowdfunding. They need to get with the program and distributed ledger the way they've done that with crowdfunding. And it shouldn't take 10 years. Anyway, I digress. Okay, what else do we have? Um, startup lawyers offer any delayed, we got a couple of questions about, um, about, uh, about, about not paying lawyers, basically. Um, so 20 years ago, um, every startup lawyer uh, in the Valley, uh, right before the dot com, uh, the dot bomb phase, took equity for fees in startup companies. We all regretted it. Okay, we all regretted it. <laughs> now there were some big wins, uh, but there were way more big losses. Uh, so now I just don't know of a lot of lawyers that will do that anymore. No matter who you are or how good you are, I just don't know of a lot of lawyers that will do that. Uh, some lawyers will, you know, will will take stock in the company, but for fees, um, it's just uh, it's just not around here. That's just my anecdotal experience. Now, this other part, though, what most lawyers will do, however, is they will delay payment until you get funded, uh, provided they believe in you, right? Provided you've got something that's a little bit more than a wing and a prayer, uh, they're willing, you know, to say, look. I'll do the work now and you can pay me, you know, three months from now when you do your first financing or get revenue or get sold. So that's a, a pretty common deal uh, that we oftentimes see, but rarely do I see lawyers take a stake in the company. And um, I don't do that anymore. How useful are NDAs in reality? Oh, um, 
Well, okay, I know where you're going with that. Um, so here's a strange thing I'm going to tell you. You might not expect to hear this from a lawyer, but uh, an NDA is just paper, okay? It's just paper, right? And it's not enough. And let me take a big step back on this. So why do you have an NDA in the first place? Uh, I know what you're going to say, well, I want to protect my, my information. Well, more than that, what you're protecting is your super valuable asset, the trade secret asset that your company is creating, right? Because that's what, you might have patents, okay? And you might have trademarks, but there's going to be trade secrets in your company if you're like most companies I deal with. And that's the know-how, the design, you know, the experience of how to do this stuff. And um, the law will protect that as long as three things are true. One, that it's secret, okay? Number two, that it's valuable, and it probably is. It's driving your company. And three, that you take reasonable measures to protect that trade secret. So one of those reasonable, me reasonable measures is to have an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement. It's not enough by itself. Uh, well, it might be enough by itself, but you don't want it to rely solely on an NDA. What you want is you want also to have really good security, right? You want to have good data security. You want to be you know, as unhackable as you can be. Uh, you want to be careful about who has the keys to your kingdom, right? You're going to be like Coca-Cola with the formula locked away in a safe someplace. Um, you don't want to give everybody in your, in, your, in, your, in your company the rights to see the whole thing. Um, so, and you also really want to have a really good trade secret protection program uh, as part of that. So yeah, an NDA in reality is super important to that because if you don't have the NDA, you've lost your trade secret protection, right? You can't even go sue somebody. If you give it to them with no NDA, the court's going to say, you didn't even bother trying to protect this. So therefore, not a secret, you lose, next case. Um, now, I think what you're really asking is, what happens if somebody breaches? How often do people sue on these? And that's a really good question because if you're you know, big public company, and little itsy bitsy company, um, you know, breaches the NDA. Yeah, you're going to sue them. You know, I see that all the time. People get sued for not all the time, but I have seen it. Okay, because you've got a deep pocket, you can afford to hire a lawyer. You can go out and chase somebody. If you're a little startup and big company breaches your NDA, which they will oftentimes. I've seen this many times. Um, in fact, uh, side note, I had a client. This is in debt on arrival, not 10,000 startups. My client's next company is in 10,000 startups, but his first company is in debt on arrival because he went and on the basis of a very flimsy NDA, you know, showed every little bit of code to a big, humongous company that competed with them, who then basically just ripped them off. And he said, what are we going to do? We're going to sue him? And I said, well, yeah, if you got an extra million dollars that you want to spend on legal fees, we can go do that. Or you can start over. Um, so, and that's what you're saying. How good is it in actuality if you've got somebody on the other side that you can't afford to litigate with? And that's why you have to be super careful that you know who you're doing business with. It's in my book, by the way who you're doing business with, what their reputation is, what it is that you're disclosing to them, how bad do they really need to see it? Uh, we need to be careful about that. So good point, don't rely just on the NDA. Um, how can we invest in startups as small investors and how do we find those? Uh, and how do we find those? Okay, so, um, well, we've got about uh, out of our 61, you know, uh, there's probably 60 entrepreneurs here right now that are uh, probably looking for, for you. Um, go on a chat, <laughs> let them know. Uh, no, uh, to, to be serious, uh, I actually talk in my book about various startup organizations um, that, that you can get involved in, uh, about various networking groups, pitch events, um, groups that, are, that basically put investors together, angels with companies. Uh, it, it takes a lot of beating on a lot of doors uh, we did a um, we did an event here for ID to IPO. It was um, I think it was Health Tech. I can't remember which tech it was, but it was a panel, a VC panel, and one of the guys was more of an angel. It was a smaller fund. Call it an angel fund, 
And he said that he invests in about one in 300 companies he sees. So you're gonna have to knock on a lot of doors, of course. Uh, but, um, but you, the investor, of course, uh, just do the same thing as what the startups are doing. You just need to be in that same community, go to the same events. Um, let's see. Okay, we have a diversity question here. Uh, somebody says, I've heard that if you're not a white male, it's more difficult to get investor funding in Silicon Valley. I think that definitely used to be true. I think that used to be true. I don't think that's so true anymore. Um, and I'll tell you, the VCs in this area, at least, uh, are very interested in diversity. And they're absolutely willing. In fact, there are funds, I think Andreessen has a fund uh, that's focused on diversity and diverse founders. So if there were ever a time uh, to go out to VCs like that, I think now would, now would be the time. You know, on a sort of similar sort of related idea, I mentioned this earlier. Um, and uh, let's see if I can share the screen again, because I do want to let you know that one of the big trends right now is ESG. And you should see a slide. How about now? All right, Jennifer's nodding. So ESG investing, the investors are, are really interested, every one of them, every institutional investor uh, is really interested in investing companies uh, that um, are, are doing something sustain, sustainable, responsible, or with impact. And I'll just tell you anecdotally, um, ESG is environmental, social, and governance. And yes, they want good government governance. I mean, they want to know you've got an AML policy and you're not taking terrorist money and you're not funding you know, illegal activities. Yes, you need procedures in place for that. Social, they'd, they'd like to know that, that you're nice to your employees you know, and, and all of that stuff. But the E has really been the big one. Uh, they want to really know that, um, that, um, that you're doing something that's environmentally friendly, or at least you're not harming the environment. So, and I just, I just mentioned that as, as kind of related to the last question we had, uh, but there's a lot of sensitivity to this. The reason why is because the SEC is demanding that public companies make disclosures about their ESG compliance. Uh, and uh, that's trickling down because that's who's going to be acquiring you. And not only that, the investors in the venture funds are insisting that the venture funds be socially responsible. So this is a big area that's just been getting bigger. All right, let me stop the share. Let's see here. Let me back up. I think I might've missed a few questions here. Sorry, I gotta open the chat now, which I've had off for a long time. So here's a question uh, somebody asked, this is a good one, about how to split up the, the founder's equity. And I talk a lot about this in the book. Um, and it, it's really, well, there's two schools of thought on this. Uh, one school is you gotta get that absolutely right at the start. Um, because if you don't, the company you know, is, is much less likely to succeed. And there's some support for this. And what I mean by right is that the equity has to align with the contributions of the founders. Now, um, there's a, a professor at Harvard Business School who's written a couple of books on this one topic about how to get, his name is Noel Wasserman, and it's how to get the equity aligned right. And he promotes what they call a dynamic split model, where basically you can adjust the equity uh, based on the contributions of the founders. And his studies say that companies that use his model uh, or something other than just an equal split, we have three founders, we split it equal, that's an equal split. Companies that use something a little more sophisticated or thoughtful about that do better um, in valuations when they go out for financing. And the reason why is because it shows, well, first of all, the interests are aligned, they're very efficient economically, and, it, and, and if they don't do that, it signals to the market that the founders can't have difficult conversations. That's his theory, okay? That's his theory. 
the data shows the 20% increase in valuation. The theory, you know, is, is because it, it says something bad about the founders if they don't get it right. So, so one way is equal split, that's most common. Another way is negotiated split. That means the person who's the best negotiator gets the most equity. I don't know if that's any better. Another way is a subjective factor. We just kind of decide, you know, on some uh, subjective measure, um, like um, uh, some formula, I should say, subjective formula. Like I'm working full time, you're working half time. I should get two thirds. You should get one third. And then the fourth way is this dynamic split. I have a fifth way that I talk about in a book that I call the Royce method, um, where we sit down with the founders and we have a discussion about what it is they're planning on doing, you know, how much time they're going to put in, what they're going to do, what stage the company is at. And we come up with a very subjective kind of view of that estimation of where they ought to be. Now, I think that's the right way to do it. But if I'm wrong, we have an escape bell and that's investing, right? And again, going back to the case of uh, Zipcar, they had best, you know, they, they just split their equity 50, 50 at the start. Investors came in later and, you know, changed all that. Um, but normally companies should not do that. Uh, but Zipcar is the example of the flip side of that argument. And the flip side of the argument that you got to get it right and then have mechanisms in place to fix it, if, you know, to tweak it if you're not right, like an option pool where you can top some people off or vesting where you can take some shares away. Uh, the flip side of that argument is that it doesn't really matter because by the time you get to an exit, you're going to have so many inflection points and so many valuation points and so many opportunities to reshuffle that deck that where you start is not all that important. Um, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. All righty here. Well, we're sort of at the uh, towards the end of our time, uh, I would like to close. I want to thank you, Jennifer, for, for walking me through this. Uh, this, is, this has been fun. This is the first time we've done a presentation without slides. Uh, I want to remind folks that um, even though you're getting a digital copy, um, if you want a hard copy, it's available for pre-order. Uh, definitely go to the YouTube channel and subscribe. And I am going to once again uh, post uh, some information for you in the chat, uh, make sure that you've chatted to me your LinkedIn address or that you found mine so we can stay in touch. And here's the YouTube channel. There we go. Um, and we'll be back again soon, going back to our usual uh, investor panels as well as presentations on startup and startup funding topics. Uh, thank you, IDEA to IPO, for, for giving me this forum here today. Thank you, Jennifer, for being uh, my, uh, my awesome host and moderator and uh, interviewer. Uh, and and thanks, thanks all. And that's it. And we will see you next time.